Hello, I'm Kevin Harrigan, Global Spec Editor-in-Chief, and I'm happy to host today's interview with Dale Ford, Chief Analyst for the Electronics Components Industry Association. As the industry's foremost trade organization, the ECIA has deep knowledge about the manufacturers and supply chains that deliver critical, advanced technologies around the globe. This makes Dale the perfect individual to quiz about supply chain challenges and trends here in 2023. So Dale, after two years of chip shortages, some industries are reporting an oversupply. Is this true? Yes, it is true. In fact, just last week, I had the opportunity to sit down with many of the world's top electronics components manufacturers. And the issue of inventory overhang was a key topic of conversation among them. So certainly uh, it is true. And uh, there are active discussions taking place right now to see how participants can best navigate through what you might call a transitionary period. Every cycle is unique and different, and this cycle is different from all others. And so while we might have learned from other cycles, um, there's, there are dynamics that played out in this cycle with how the extremes really were played out in terms of supply and demand and lead times, especially uh, that took place in this cycle. So uh, the challenge we have right now is multifold, including the fact that just the mix of products that people have on hand, you may have an oversupply of one certain product, but because you're lacking another product, you're unable to produce uh, your, your product. So they will have to work that out. There's discussions about how they can best reposition, I guess you could say, inventory uh, across the marketplace so that chips and other components can get to where they're needed and uh, and taken off the books of where, you know, they're oversupplying. So, yes, there is an inventory overhang, and it's a significant issue now that all players, the manufacturers and the distributors and their customers are going to have to navigate the Semiconductor Industry Association has characterized some of the recent declines in semiconductor growth as part of the natural cycle of the industry. Is this an assessment you would agree with? Yeah, I've been a, a champion of the cycle and it, the role it plays in our marketplace. We've been through, you know, multiple cycles and I've charted them all out really to see, you know, where they, uh, where the, the upside of the cycle begins, where we reach our peak and then come down again. And so cycles have been driven by various factors. Uh, sometimes they're driven by a technology uh, introduction and adoption. Sometimes they're driven by economic and financial factors. Uh, so there are different things that drive the cycles, but our industry is a cyclical industry. It's very clear if you look at the growth trends. And so in this cycle, we of course uh, had both the dynamic of new technologies coming into the marketplace when we were recovering from the pandemic shutdowns that we had. So we've kind of gone through a supercharged period where it's been an exciting time where in addition to both catching up with unmet market demand, we've also seen exciting new advances in the technologies that are coming to market that drive new demand. And so we've seen that on the upside of the cycle, but we are definitely coming down the backside of this current cycle right now. I'll follow up with a different question. Do you expect a bounce back year for memory chips? <laughs> this has been a devastating period for, for memories. Um, this, this is one of the steepest declines uh, in recent history that we've seen in memory revenues. It's been dramatic and steep. Uh, the all the way up through the most recent data reported by the World Semiconductor Trade Statistics WSTS organization <clears throat> through January. Uh, the most recent data just shows it's, it's, it's almost a staggering collapse in revenues uh, worldwide for the main memory products, DRAM and NAND flash. And so I think the best I could say is that the rebound might be best viewed as a dead cat bounce. <laughs> I mean, it's it's come down so hard so fast that it's 
it's going to hit a bottom at some point and rebound off that bottom. But how strong that rebound is will really be the question. Um, the, the main drivers of memory, uh, you look at smartphones, a key driver, you know, it's questionable. Will we really see introduction of next generation products in the smartphone area that will drive demand? On the other hand, I certainly do believe that there will be continued strong demand for everything related to data creation, data uh, transmission, storage, um, analysis, uh, communication. All of those areas in data are continuing to just grow exponentially. And so the, the memory technologies required to support that, it will grow in the long term. I have no doubt about that. But in the near term, uh, just how strong the near term rebound is, like I say, the first thing will be this kind of just, you got to come off the bottom at some point. We've gone so deep and so low. But the strength of that recovery and how quickly it takes place is the main question. What you call the dead cat bounce. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how will reshoring or friend shoring strategies affect chip supply and demand in the next few years? Well, that's become real. You know, we've talked about reshoring. We've talked about friend shoring for many years now, but it's become a reality uh, now. People are seeing the necessity of it. The geopolitical situation is, is pushing companies to really act uh, and not just talk about the reshoring and the friend shoring. And so there are multiple benefits. One that is I think the most important, which is uh, creating greater stability and confidence in the supply chain itself. Uh, that's been a major issue that we've gone through where the supply chain has been under threat for multiple avenues. In fact, I, I find quite interesting. I follow regularly the Lehigh University. They have a supply chain risk index where they measure uh, 10 different aspects of risk to the supply chain. And uh, right now, the economic risk is key. A cybersecurity risk is key. Um, transportation, other, other risks come into play, but you know, we've seen the, the wide swing in shipping costs that you have when you have a, a freight delivered by container ships or by air freight. All of these areas have been sources of risk and instability. You move towards an onshoring or friend shoring type of situation and you just simply remove a lot of that risk, which is helpful in that it will, it will encourage additional investment in the industry. Uh, you know, investors look at the risk profile and look at the type of return they need depending on that risk. And if you're able to minimize and reduce a great deal of that risk in one aspect, you're able to encourage, I would say, additional investment in our industry, which it, it certainly needs. Because we are moving towards a fragmented world now. Uh, from we've gone through a world where we had free trade, open global markets, and uh, we've definitely uh, transitioned away from that now in our current geopolitical environment. And so we will become more reliant on local supplies and local production at all stages of the electronics component supply chain and electronics in the local and friendly markets that, that will be taking place. So there are other benefits, of course, that it will reduce uh, lead times and the shipping costs, it, it could reduce costs associated with things like um, uh, tariffs and, and other elements that come into play. So you'll see reduced costs, but it will be a transition. It's not like you can just flip a switch and it turns on. The plans that you're seeing announced right now, these are, are 10, 15, 20 year plans in some cases that companies, major players are going to be executing on. So it won't be an overnight transition, but the good part from my perspective is it's actually starting now. Last question for today. Are there other <laughs> technologies chip makers should be exploring to expand growth? Could be things like printed circuits or artificial intelligence or something else? Well, there's there's two areas where you can look, both on both sides of it. One side is, you know, 
we, we focus a lot on the process geometry advances and what we can achieve with Moore's law. And, you know, Intel has stated that uh, they do not see Moore's law coming to an end. We've talked for a while, for a few years now about Moore's law coming to an end. But if you look at uh, Intel CEO, he's saying, no, we're going to continue to drive this down the, the periodic chart and we're going to continue pursuing Moore's law advances. So we'll continue to see advances there, but then there's the more than more side of things that, that it's labeled. And this is where we get into other types of materials, the three, five materials, the silicon carbide, gallium nitride. These products, I believe, especially with gallium nitride, we've just scratched the surface in terms of the benefits that they can bring. Um, Multi-chip modules, there's much more that can be done there with that and the packaging technologies associated with those products. Uh, we certainly can't overlook <laughs> the packaging arena and the advances that can be made there. And uh, just the, the, the overall architectures and designs that you can, can develop using um, a, a range of technologies beyond just reducing the process geometries. Now, on the other side, in terms of driving demand and opportunities for these products, it was um, impressive to me at the last Consumer Electronics Show what a transition has taken place at that show. For many years, you'd go to that show and you'd see the latest and greatest TVs with the, the big screens, the high pixel, you know, the you know, pixel um, densities and the various technologies and TVs or smartphones or various types of consumer electronics products. This year, the emphasis at the consumer electronics show really revolved more around uh, environmental and green technologies. So you looked in the automotive space, you saw many new technologies coming to play, reuse of technologies, platforms that can be uh, built on and developed. So <clears throat> the automotive and transportation space, I see as, a, as an exciting growth opportunity moving forward, even, even going out into space <laughs> with, uh, with the technologies out into space and Elon Musk's and others' ambitions into the space. But, but I was very impressed with those technologies, but then there were so many technologies that were shown in terms of reducing carbon emissions, reducing reliance on fossil fuels, uh, more efficient technologies, and you know, complete you know, systems level solutions to um, addressing serious environmental concerns. And so I believe that especially given the drive in ESG. Now I know that ESG is controversial. There's pushback on that and concerns if you take it to an extreme, but ESG managed properly is going to incentivize companies to pursue more green investments. And I think that that's a good thing in our environment. And I think that those areas create real opportunities. And so the industrial technologies, the production technologies, these uh, areas that might have been overlooked, I would say, in the past, they've reemerged as, as very important markets for technology. And I expect that while consumer markets aren't going to go away, we'll see great new opportunities in these other areas. Beyond that, you know, there's the backbones that we have to look at. I mentioned 5G being the network of networks, but you also look at um, edge-based or fog uh, computing, uh, flexible, intelligent networks out there where we're becoming more intelligent in terms of where we position the actual processing uh, and manipulation of data. And so I believe that those edge technology developments will play a, a more significant role over time with the benefits that those will bring into play. Um, you look at quantum computing. We're just really still at the pioneering stage of quantum computing and how that might play out to boost to what has been just in the recent months, just this explosion of publicity about regenerative, regenerative AI, the, the chat GPT really mm -hmm. created a, a frenzy out there almost. And so, but, but while, you know, that's exciting. It's more, 
Pastor, would you, how would I say it? It's not at this point really a tool that could be relied on, but it's beginning to point a way forward that artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning types of technologies, which in the industrial world we've been de developing for some time now, but those are going to play a bigger role. And so this advanced high-speed computing types of technologies that you could achieve with quantum computing solutions, I think there will be a, a healthy synergy there. So there's the great thing about it is there's no end to innovation and the advances of technology in our world. You know, I've charted out over time the, the products that have come to market and, and the just the incredible increased accelerated pace of advanced technologies. You know, you, in our day, you know, we'll, we'll sit down and say, gosh, you know, what more can we do than we have done? And somehow this cycle, this, this, this growth in technology and the advances just continues to accelerate. It's, it's exciting and scary at the same time. <laughs> Dale, I want to thank you for your time today to help educate our audience about the latest in supply chain trends. 